Good morning. Good morning. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. I want to uh, invite you to uh, to share the peace of Christ. Um, greet each other with those words. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Go ahead and stand. Turn some people to your right and left. For the spring tea for the ladies spring tea uh, please see uh, one of the people on the spring tea committee Jean Burgess Barbara Dawson Janet Jones Marty Morales Pat Rodler or Donna Virgin to purchase tickets uh, we do sell out and um, the space is limited so make sure you get your tickets before they're gone this year's one great hour of sharing will be um, donated to the Malawi Africa in response to the recent flooding there are envelopes in the pew and at the back table if you'd like to donate. Please plan to participate in our All Church Beautification Day. It will be Saturday, April 25th. There's details in the bulletin and uh, you can contact Steve Wicked if you have any questions. Thank you. want to invite the uh, choir to come forward. Uh, the choir as they sing uh, this opening prelude. I invite you to quiet your hearts and minds and to prepare uh, uh, yourselves to worship this God who has come to us graciously in Jesus Christ. Let's prepare for worship.
if you feel more comfortable reading out the hymnal. Hallelujah, give thanks. Page 106 in the hymnal. <laughs>
Bishops and lightning in his fist. And the Lord, he wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above and reigns from power and power.
Oh, did you have a sleepover on Friday? Because sometimes Fridays are special days like that. Well, on this Friday, Jesus was put to death on the cross, and then they buried him, but they couldn't do a lot of work because it was the beginning of the Sabbath. And the Jewish people weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath, and so they placed him in the tomb. But they wanted to go back early on the first day of the week, that is the day right after the Sabbath, and, and anoint his body. You know, they didn't have funeral homes back then. So when they uh, buried somebody, they, they took the body, they would, they would put um, special um, ointments and oils um, and perfumes on the body, and then they would wrap that body in cloth, and they would place it in like a cave, um, and that would be how they buried people. And they didn't get a chance to do all that they wanted to do for Jesus' body before they had to put him in the tomb. So Mary's up early. When she gets there, what does she find? He's not there. She's really concerned. She's very distressed because Jesus was so special to her. But the stone is rolled away, and the tomb is open. <coughs> And the tomb is empty. And there is no better news than that the tomb is empty. Now we're going to get further on in the story in just a little bit where Jesus actually sees Mary and Mary sees Jesus and he greets her and he calls her by name. That's the one other thing I want you to remember this morning. The tomb is empty. And it's not empty because Jesus just disappeared. It's empty because Jesus rose from the dead and he calls you each by name. He says, Nebea, you're my special friend, my daughter. He says that to each of you. He calls each of you by name. Yeah, Jesus, he calls your name. You just have to listen. You just have to listen. You do what you want. Well, we all do that. <laughs> Jesus does call your name because you're, you are our, our princess. Did you know that? Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're a baby princess. All children of God are princes and princesses. Yeah. yeah, I know that. Well, let's say a prayer. And we're going to say a prayer that we'll hear Jesus when he calls our voice. Because the tomb is empty. He's risen. Let's pray. Dear, dear Lord in heaven, we do pray that you would help us to hear. Help us to hear you calling our name. Because um, we too are special. You know us and you love us deeply. Help us to hear your voice and to trust in you because you've risen from the grave. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, go back to your seats. Thank you again for the music, those who sang. Take a moment now to uh, offer our prayers um, and concerns to this God who is, uh, who is the victor over sin and death. He's a God who sits um, now at the right hand of the Father pleading on our behalf. So let's join our hearts together as we um, come before God with our prayers. Holy God, in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen one, we come before you and we ask that you would hear us now. Um, hear us as we humbly pray for those who are in need of your presence, our need of, of healing, guidance, wisdom, strength, those who are in need of hope, those who, uh, who face uncertainties. Um, certainly we ask that you would be present in the life of Sherry, as she faces open heart surgery, 
be present in her life, Lord God. Be present um, through those who will treat her and care for her, doctors, nurses, therapists. Pray the same for Bobby <coughs> Shigal's cancer. For Holly Jordan, who is recovering from surgery, we pray, Father, for your presence with her. Heal um, her body. Restore her health. Help her to know that you hold her close. We pray, Father, for Luann Wheeler. You know her needs, and we ask that you would guard and keep her now and in these days ahead. We pray the same for Valerie. We, we trust, Lord, that you can provide for all that she needs. She battles health issues. We pray, Father, for Joyce. Wrap her in your care and draw her close to yourself. Lord, we pray for the family of Joanne Gradkowski. This time of the loss of Joanne, beautiful mother and grandmother, we pray, Father, for you to be this family's hope and confidence. May the the reality of the resurrection provide them all the strength that they need at this time. We pray the same, Lord, for others in our midst, others who we know who have lost loved ones recently, that the, the word of hope in the resurrection would, would be enough to sustain them and guard them and keep them. Father, we pray for... Uh, we pray for our community, and particularly, Lord, we pray for those in our community who don't know you. We ask that as your resurrection people, that we would bear witness in our lives and in our words to the reality of life in Jesus, the, this good news that we celebrate this morning. May that good news be heard from our lips and be seen in our lives throughout this community. Be with your church around the world. We know, Lord, that our brothers and sisters all around the world share in this same celebration today. Bearing testimony, bearing witness to the power of the gospel that went from good news proclaimed, witnessed by a few women, a handful of women who were at the empty tomb, to the millions upon millions of disciples of Jesus around the world today and saints who have gone before us. We thank you and praise you. Guard your church. And may your church be found faithful. We offer these prayers, Lord, knowing that uh, in the end, the risen Christ is king. And his kingdom is what he came to establish. We pray for that kingdom now using the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our second scripture lesson we pick up uh, here in the Gospel of John. Again, John's, uh, John's account is, uh, is a much longer account than what we uh, encounter in Mark or Matthew. And we pick up the story here with uh, Mary um, back at the tomb. It doesn't uh, say there in those first ten verses that she accompanies 
Peter and John going back to the tomb. John is the one who Jesus loved, the author of the gospel. is. Uh, that's his way of, of referring to himself in his own gospel. So when you read that, the one who Jesus loved, or the beloved one, that's John, the author of the gospel. But Mary obviously has, uh, has followed them back to the tomb. John and Peter don't stay around. They went back to where they were staying. That is the upper room. They were like uh, some of these young men in the congregation here. They were hiding out. It's the women who are at the tomb faithfully early in the morning. It's the women who go back to the tomb. Men, buck up. <laughs> I, I include myself in that. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray together. Quicken our hearts and our minds now, Lord. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Awaken us to your truth, your reality. Help us to shake off the doubt that would cling to our hearts and our minds. 
that we might believe. In Jesus' name. So we, uh, here we are um, finishing up the, um, the signs. We're on the final sign. Present. Back up to present. There you go. And allow. The final sign, you know, for those of you who are uh, with us visiting this morning, we've been working our way through John's Gospel because John's Gospel first half has seven signs that are pointers, revealers to the glory of God. They reveal God's glory in Jesus Christ. And John concludes his gospel with this final sign, victory. A final sign that, that screams out, that shouts out at the, at the top of his lungs off the page, Jesus is victorious. Jesus is victorious over the grave. Um, early morning, it's dark. Um, the enemy is at the gate. All hope is lost. Um, this is kind of how the disciples felt, but I'm thinking in terms of the, uh, the second of J.R. Tolkien's um, trilogy, um, The Two Towers and the Battle for Helm's Deep. Any, any, um, any Tolkien fans in here. Okay, so some of you know this. So the, here's how the movie goes. You know, the movie is, this is the climax of Tolkien's story, The Two Towers. They think all is lost. And um, Aragon um, says to King Theoden, let's ride out one last time. It may be hopeless, but at least we die trying. And then um, Gimli, the little dwarf, he sees the sun coming in, the early morning sun coming in the window. He says, the sun is rising. And, and at that moment, at that moment, Aragon remembers Gandalf's words. He remembers Gandalf saying, look to my coming on the first light of the fifth day at dawn. Look to the east. And there's Gandalf with all of the riders, the ro Rohim, um, the, the riders of Rohan, and they, they show up um, and they win the day. Hope is not lost. With the dawn comes this incredible good news. With the rising of the sun. And so here is Mary Magdalene, one of this band of followers of Jesus, disciples. And we know that Mary is not alone as she comes to the grave. Um, she uses the plural we when, she, when they're reporting to, um, to the disciples that they, uh, the grave is empty. Um, we know from the other gospel accounts that she's accompanied by other women, women who, were, um, who followed Jesus and cared for him. They were close to him. They took care of him and his disciples. She comes early in the morning, it says, on the first day day, on the first day of the week, and this question that will come up over and over again, it comes up for Mary, it comes up for Peter and the disciples, it comes up again for Thomas, it comes up again for us this morning, it, it ought to, this question ought to shake us a little bit and wake us up. Do you believe? Do you believe? Asks Jesus. Mary comes early in the morning on the first day of the week. Why the first day of the week? What's so... Um, yeah, I, I explained a little bit there in the children's time. You know, they, they couldn't work on the Sabbath. But there seems to be another emphasis uh, uh, beyond the, the simple fact of needing to wait until the Sabbath was over that all of the gospel writers emphasize that it's on the eighth day. It's on the first day of the week. We have this pattern that the work, the work of crucifixion, what does Jesus say of his ministry? He says, I have come to do the work of the Father. 
And the work of the Father is to do my Father's will. And my Father's will is that I stretch out my arms on that cross. The work that Jesus has come to do is completed on the sixth day, appropriately enough, at the end of the Jewish week of work. His work is finished when he says from the cross, what? It is finished. It is finished. The Sabbath day is this day of rest. Jesus resting in the grave. And on the first day of the week, a new creation comes into being. A new creation, the reason that it is the first day of the week is because now Jesus as the risen Lord, as the, the new Adam, is now recreating the world. Calling a new creation into being. And that begins with the disciples, but it continues on into our lives. His desire for us, as he asks us, do you believe, is to create in us new life. To create in us new life. <coughs> Hezekiah, uh, an early church father, says it this way when he's um, preaching a, an Easter sermon on this uh, passage. Hidden first in a womb of flesh, he sanctified human birth by his own birth. Hidden afterward in the womb of the earth, he gave life to the dead by his resurrection. Indeed, as Jesus is born to newness of life at his resurrection, he takes with him, brings with him all who will trust in him. Why is it that um, we have the details that we have in John's Gospel? You have the details of Peter and John running. Um, and it's almost, almost like John is trying to say, my testimony is as good as Peter's. Peter's testimony is what lays behind Mark's Gospel. Um, Peter's well known. He's well respected in the church. It's almost as if John is saying, look, my gospel testimony is as good as Peter's. In fact, I beat him to the tomb. He's an old man. He's a little slow, out of breath. I was in a little better shape. I got there first. But out of respect to Peter, or maybe he was afraid, I don't know. But out of respect to Peter, we go with the, the first. Um, I let him look in first. And then I followed him in. And when I saw grave clothes, right? They see the, the grave clothes. It, it's interesting that in the accounts the, the point behind the grave clothes is, is that um, for the body simply to be moved, they would be moved with the grave clothes, but the description is almost as if the grave clothes were wrapped up and set very neatly on the slab where Jesus would have been laying. I saw the grave clothes, and I believed, says John. I saw and believed these details that come to play. The gardener, Mary, um, coming back to the tomb, meets Jesus, sees him. After being confronted by the angels, she's distraught because her Lord has been taken. And she sees Jesus and mistakes him for the gardener. Funny details. And then the details, the details even of Thomas. Um, doubting Thomas, we, we give uh, this pejorative um, uh, qualification to Thomas in, in a very unfortunate way. Which, which of us have not doubted? But even the, the details of Thomas wanting to place his hands in Jesus' side to touch his wounds. And yet when he sees Jesus, what does he do? He falls down and he worships. 
my Lord and my God, exclaims Thomas. These details, uh, there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing profound about them. They are a simple way for John to say this is true. This is true. The, the report that I'm giving, the story that I'm telling, isn't a fiction. This isn't, this isn't wishful thinking. This is what happened. This is what happened. Maybe the most significant part of that story, though, is that moment when Jesus speaks Mary's name. She's distraught, she's weeping, and she mistakes him for the gardener until he speaks her name. Mary. Mary. I asked the children if they could hear Jesus speaking their name. I ask you as well. <coughs> You know, uh, you know. I, I know that um, there are some here who, who probably would say, uh, "Do you believe?" Yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in God. God, generic G O D. That's that's a generic name, uh, and that's not the same as Jesus speaking your name and you saying, "Rabboni." Or, my Lord and my God, Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God. I know that uh, it's easy for us to just kind of snooze through this day because we've heard it all before, right? Just kind of snooze through the day. It's easy for us to say, well, you know, I believe, yeah, sure, I, I believe I'm, I'm a generally good person, right? I don't do any of those really, really bad, nasty things. You know, there are, there are lots of people who are worse than me. Or do I believe, well, I believe Jesus was a, was a good guy, but, you know, I, I, I see on, online, you know, I, I go on YouTube, and there are some really smart people who say, oh, the resurrection couldn't have happened. Or, uh, no, Jesus never really claimed to be the Son of God. And, I, you know, they have pretty persuasive arguments. And so Jesus speaks your name now. If that's you, if, if that is your place right now, um, I believe in God, generic, G-O-D. Uh, I, I believe I'm a generally good person. You know, God, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. Or, um, yeah, Jesus, nice guy, important teacher, but nothing, nothing this resurrection stuff is just kind of hoaxy. If that's you, Jesus, Jesus, the risen Savior, is speaking your name. Do you hear him? Do you hear him? He speaks your name because of the depth of his love and his desire to recreate. He speaks your name because he wants to invite you to be part of this new creation. It is the first day of the week, my friends. That's what Sunday is. Sunday is the first day of the week. This is the first day of the week when we recognize that a new creation has begun and it begins in us. Are we ready? Do you believe that Jesus speaks your name and wants to bring about a new creation in you, that he invites you to follow him and to love him. Do you believe, do you believe that this risen Lord whose, whose side could be touched, whose hands outstretched bore the marks of love, do you believe that he calls your name now? invites you to be part of his new creation. Listen. Listen for him. He calls you now. Do you believe? Do you believe? Let's pray. Lord God, for your
resurrection miracle, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of life. We give you thanks and praise for the beauty and the wonder of the empty tomb. We give you praise for the fact that you speak each of our names. We give you thanks and praise. We are humbled to be counted among your people. We are humbled, Lord Jesus, that over the centuries, 21 centuries removed from your resurrection, you still are calling people by name that we might recognize you as the risen Lord. Thank you and praise you. Move in our hearts now that we might receive from you all that you have to offer. Your very life.
And so as we come to the table this morning, we come recognizing that it is the risen Lord Jesus who we meet here. That his body which is given for us and his blood which is shed for us is for us um, life. A share in his life and a future share in his glory. We have it from the Apostle Paul that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks to his Father in heaven, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. And in the same way, following the meal, he took the cup again, he gave thanks, gave the cup to his disciples, and he said, take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes in glory. Let's pray together. Lord God, we ask that uh, you would be uh, present. Risen Lord Jesus, be present in the bread and the cup today. Seal to our hearts at this table. Seal to our hearts the confident trust on our behalf in your promises. That in dying with you, we are raised. Bless now this table in the name of Jesus we pray. This table is set for all who believe, all who, who trust, um, who say, Jesus, my Lord and my God, are welcome to this table. So as the elders and deacons come forward to serve, I invite you to hear Jesus calling your name.
John's Gospel. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let's receive together. <coughs> Following the meal, Jesus took the cup gave thanks to his Father in heaven, gave the cup to his disciples, and he said, take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Friends, this cup is the 
evidence, the sign, the reminder of the final sign uh, of victory, victory over the grave, over death and sin, and all that would keep us from being a new creation. Let's drink together. Lord Jesus, we offer you thanks and praise for this meal. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the gift of your Son, the Spirit of the living God. We give you praise and thanks that you move in our midst, in our hearts, and in our minds. Father, Son, and Spirit, receive from us our thanksgiving and praise this day and throughout all time. In the name of Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. Such a rich gift of the life of Jesus um, demands from us a response that is both joyful um, and full of gratitude. So I invite the ushers forward to receive our tithes and offerings, and I invite I invite each of us to give um, out of joy and gratitude for the Lord's goodness.
Lord of glory, the resurrected changes everything. We can't help but desire to give you our very lives in gratitude for this incredible gift of the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. To his victory over sin and death, we may know victory over the selfishness that would lead us to cling to our lives, our talents, and our resources. Receive our offering this morning and bless it. Multiply its influence so that our tithes and offerings may bear fruit 100-fold for your kingdom and the resurrection may be declared throughout the creation. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. This is a new praise and worship song uh, that we're going to end the service with. The children are going to join us. The contemporary singers are going to join us. And I ask that you sing along as you start to learn the piece called God, Great God.
And uh, a quick announcement for children. Um, at the conclusion here of the worship time, my understanding is that uh, Easter Bunny or somebody has left some eggs hidden out in the yard around the church. So following the benediction, um, if you'd like to gather back in the lounge, there is somebody who will try to keep you in some kind of an order <laughs> heading out um, and have fun uh, finding some eggs. This God who is our God forever and ever is the God who says, um, I have conquered sin and death, and I go with you forever and ever. That's Jesus' promise, that he is with us um, always. And so go from this place, trusting, believing that you have met the risen Lord here, and he goes with you in the power of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Shall they thirst anymore? Preach, preacher. But God shall wipe away. Yes, sir. Every tear from their eye. Yes, sir. Get ready for the revolution. Come on. Come on.